Go ahead and open your Bibles to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. Um, very interesting chapter. All sorts of goodies in there. I could probably do an entire series out of this chapter alone. Um, but we're going to focus on some things in particular. Because as you know, we're in the middle of a series right now that's focused on how we as followers of Christ walking in this fallen world, this broken world that we live in, uh, how do we engage in what is our role in what is commonly referred to as the culture war, right? We talked about how in reality, whenever we talk about the culture war, what's generally being talked about is you know, the norms and the traditions and the societal practices and the way things are done, right? Um, that really what is undergirding that, what the real issue is, isn't the traditions of society. It's a spiritual war going on underneath that. And then we also know that um, if we're going to engage in this spiritual conflict, in this culture war, um, if you will, that really where we need to start is on the home front, Right? In, in any war, to use the analogy, you've got the front lines where the battles are being fought, but then you've got on the home front where we're doing the things that are needed to strengthen up the war effort. And so we need to make sure that we are fighting the battles on the home front, that we are living according to the designs and the commands of God. Right? That before we try to change things out there, Make sure, make sure we're changing things in here. Right? I, I, we, we mentioned how you know, often at the question and answers, uh, most every time, right, the question comes up, uh, what will it take for there to be revival? Which, of course, real revival starts in our own hearts. So much we want to ask, what will it take for there to be revival in, in the culture, revival in society, revival in our nation, revival in our community? When first we need to ask, what is it going to take for there to be revival in my heart. And so that's what we focus on, on the home front of the culture war. So, so what, what about the front lines? I mean, well, what's actually supposed to be taking place? How does it look that whenever we combat, if you want to use that language, right, there in culture and society and the community? Well, in Acts chapter 19, we actually see an example of what it looks like when Christianity wins the culture war kind of what it took, how it got there, and what it looks like when uh, the ways of God are winning. What happens is what we're going to see, we actually end up seeing a city, indeed a whole region there in uh, Asia Minor, who has changed to the point that people are destroying the paraphernalia of their sin and their wickedness, and it's actually affecting the local economy such that people who profit off of sin is, you know, starting that they are starting to lose money. And so let's actually look in here in Acts chapter 19 at what took place in Ephesus and how maybe we can learn from this uh, example in Scripture. Starting in verse 8, it uh, says that Paul entered the synagogue... And he spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. And so as we look at what the events are that actually lead up to this change in the community of Ephesus, we see that it starts off with Paul going into the synagogue. That was his habit. He didn't go straight to the Greeks. He went to the people of God, to the Jews, and he would teach in the synagogues. And so we see him going there, and he does uh, three things. He speaks boldly, he argues persuasively, and his focus is on the kingdom of God. First off, he is speaking boldly. So often, whenever you talk of culture war issues, how do people tend to talk? How do we represent the things of God in our culture? Do we just kind of represent it as our opinion? our personal belief. Oh, well, you know, I, I believe this about that issue. I believe. Or do we speak boldly about this is the truth that God has written down in his word, that things should be this way and not that way? Do we speak boldly? See, too often the temptation can be, don't rock the boat, don't make waves, 
don't cause any trouble. Kind of the terminology that became popular uh, in past years has been that Christianity, as we engage the culture, we, that we need to be winsome, uh, which will make sense in just the general sense of the word of being, you know, kind of, uh, you know, the Bible says as much as it's up to you, be at peace with all men, right? Not, not to be crude and rude and all that kind of stuff. What it's really come to mean in a lot of times is um, not to be offensive, right? Kind of the primary commandment in our society is thou shalt not offend, course if that's the case then you can never preach the gospel you can never proclaim the truth of god's word because god's word itself says that the gospel is an offense and a stumbling block to those who are in sin so did paul go into the synagogue acting like well you know i mean if i go in there talking about jesus really being god and being the only way that might offend some people so i'm going to go in there and kind of just no he went in there and he boldly proclaimed the truth. He didn't go in there thinking, well, you know, if I'm too pushy, it might make people a little uncomfortable. No, he went in there and it says he boldly taught in the synagogue. And he was there for three months. Often we get rebuffed once and we give up. Well, you know, I tried to tell them. They didn't want to hear it. Really? How many times did you tell them? There's... I may get in trouble for this one. There's a, a joke. There's a, a kind of teacher, I don't know, slash comedian, uh, Mark Gunger. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Uh, marriage counsel a lot of times. Um, uh, the issue, he talks about marriage issues a lot. And he said that one time he had a lady come up to him and uh, say, well, my husband just won't do what I'm asking him to do. And he said, well, how many times do you tell him? Well, once. Well, why'd you only tell him once? Right? Ladies, but we're thick-headed. You got to tell us over and over and over and over again. In order for it to stick. Fact is, a lot of times what happens is, because it's an uncomfortable conversation to get into on a lot of these issues, and so we'll have a conversation with a friend, a family member, a coworker. It doesn't go well. They don't want to hear it. They offer challenges. They're obviously not open. And so we go, well, well I tried. We have to try again. Try again. It's actually a uh, good moral principle to have tenacity or what a friend of mine called stick to itiveness. Right? That, that you, you know what you got to get done, you know what you're trying to accomplish, and you just stay at it. Did you know that most people are convinced about something because they hear it over and over and over again? It's very, very rare that somebody hears something once and all of a sudden, oh, eyes are open, mind has changed. And I'm trying to remember where I heard it, and I might have the number off just a little bit, but it's not by much that the average person before they come to accept Christ, they've had the gospel preached or spoken to them an average of the number I've been remembering is 23 times. What's interesting is so often we think of evangelism as more of a sales pitch when really the image that the scripture gives is that of gardening of time, of tending and growing, tending the soil, pulling the weeds, removing the rocks, adding some water, and the harvest comes after a season of preparation. So often, we want that quick fix. Well, that's just how we are. But you notice it says that Paul, he went in there, he took his time, he spent the time in there months reasoning, teaching, arguing in the synagogue, boldly proclaiming it, it also says he was persuasive. He wasn't just making statements. Unfortunately, our society seems to really enjoy bumper sticker slogans and memes and just quick little one-off statements. Uh, and unfortunately, the church seems to be no difference. Right? A lot of people present the gospel in that bumper sticker format. Right? Turn or burn is a little outdated, but it's that kind of slogan where we just say that pithy statement, oh, well, they didn't want to hear it. But no, you have to be persuasive. It actually takes some work. You need to actually know your facts, know what the gospel is, know some answers to some questions. That actually means you need to know the word. You need to know some of your doctrine. You need to know your theology so that whenever you're in the conversation, you actually have a basis of knowledge from which you are working from. It also means you need to know your audience. You actually need to know who you're talking to and have an idea of understanding of how they might respond. 
Whenever Paul went into the synagogue to talk to Jews, he knows he's talking to people who see themselves. We are the God's chosen people, descendants of Abraham, and who are devoted to the Old Testament scriptures. And so, of course, he's going to approach it that way because he knows his audience. He knows who he's talking to, trying to be persuasive. So we need to present the truth, whatever the issue is, presenting the gospel on some social issue, some culture war topic, whatever it is, in such a way that's going to make them think about it. Might remember we've done the study a couple of times uh, through the book called Tactics that is actually talking about how you engage in things, often using uh, questions strategically done in such a way as to generate thought. So he goes in, he's preaching boldly, he's taking his time, he's being persuasive, but notice what it says his topic, that his focus is. He's proclaiming the kingdom of God. See, the culture war is often presented as being over traditions, norms, practices, that sort of thing, but that's all surface level. What's really going on, as we talked about in the first week, is it's a spiritual war of deeper things going on. We're not called to conform society to a superficial pattern of behavior. What we're actually called to do is we've been commissioned by Christ to make disciples. We preach the gospel, Christ changes the hearts, and changed hearts change a community. So he's there, he's talking, he's preaching boldly, he's being persuasive, but not everybody is persuaded. Verse 9 says, but some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. That the word, the way, it's how they described the teachings of Christ in Christianity. It says, so Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. We don't know who Tyrannus is. We don't know where this lecture hall is. Apparently, it was some guy named Tyrannus who had a place. Uh, he's most likely a Greek. He's a Gentile. Because, you know, the, the Greeks had, I mean, it's like their pastime was to get together and discuss and argue things and teach and hear new um, ideas. And so Paul said, well, if the Jews don't want to hear it, I'll go to the Greeks. So he goes over to the lecture hall of Tyrannus. He takes the disciples, the Jews who have believed, and off they go. But notice the pushback. They didn't just go, sorry, Paul, we don't want what you're selling. Go on, go away. It says that they publicly maligned Christianity. They didn't just disbelieve and ask him to leave. They went out and publicly were defaming what he was teaching. Many people do this in today's society when the truth is actually starting to penetrate people's hearts. Where there's actually persuasiveness and boldness being spoken and preached. You'll often see things whenever godly principles are being proclaimed and taught and making uh, headway in society that they go and they malign and lie about and slander these things. Um, I'm not getting political here in the next examples I'm going to give. I'm just giving some examples. In Florida, they passed a bill saying, hey, uh, stop talking to little kids about adult situations. Teachers have no business talking to elementary kids about those sorts of things. And what did the media and everybody say? Oh, it's a don't say gay bill. No, it had nothing to do with the bill. It had absolutely nothing to do with the bill. They went out and they maligned it and they lied about it and they slandered it in order to turn people's minds and hearts against it they went out and they lied, and they slandered, and they maligned it. There was actually a lot of people on, um, I, I know Twitter's not real life, but for some people it is, and there were a lot of people on Twitter who actually got banned and censored because they were pointing out that, hey, this activity that they're wanting to do in our schools with our children, this is grooming them. And they said, no, you can't say groomer. And you would actually get banned. They'd say, and their explanation for why you can't point at something and say that's grooming, they'd say, because it's LGBT hate. Well, hold on a second, we're not talking about LGBT people in particular, we're just saying don't teach kids these things. But they had to malign it and twist it and slander it. Whenever you oppose critical race theory being taught in schools, they say you just want to whitewash history. You just don't want real history to be taught. No, I want real history to be taught. What I don't want to be taught 
is hatred and discrimination and treating people unequally based on their race, which is exactly what critical race theory does. They, no, 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 no. So what they do is they go out and malign it, and they lie and they slander about the motivations of people. One thing that we know is that only God can change hard hearts. Paul, after three months of proclaiming boldly, he decides to leave because as tenacious and as persuasive as Paul was, they just weren't willing to hear it. There are always going to be those minds who are closed off to the truth. Even Jesus, there were places that he didn't hang around in where it specifically says he didn't do any miracles there because of their lack of belief. Whenever he sends out the disciples to go preach, he says, if they will not receive you, shake the dust of that town from your sandals and move on. And so Paul moved on. I think there's a lesson in there for us as too. Whenever someone is so obstinate, perhaps maybe we do need to move on. Verse 10. So this went on for two years. What went on? The discussions that he's having in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. So he went to the synagogue for a few months, and he did what he could there, and they wouldn't receive him, so he moved on. And for two years, he's gathering in this place, and he's having discussions, and he's teaching, and he's talking. It says, so that all the Jews and the Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. One thing we need to see here is it takes time. Three months over there. They dug in their heels. He went over there. And yes, the name of the Lord grew in fame, but it took two years he spent there teaching. Fact is, we are an impatient society. Amen? We are an impatient society. You remember whenever uh, it, it was the case that in order to watch your favorite TV show, you, you had to wait a week because it wasn't coming on until the next week. It ended with that cliffhanger, and you're like, who, who? Now you gotta wait. Not anymore. You gotta wait a week. Hey, you can pull up Netflix or Disney or whatever your you know, preferred sinful app is and just binge watch those things one after the other. You don't have to wait till next week to see the next episode. You just click a button. Actually, most of them, you don't have to click a button. It'll automatically roll over for you and start the next episode. Right? We are an impatient people. We want it now. I wanna go home and binge watch. I don't wanna have to wait a week to see my next episode. And I don't want to have to wait like a week or two in order to get my delivery. I want it tomorrow. And it'll provide it. You go online, you order something, you click that button. It might even be here today, depending on what it is and where it's shipping from. And I don't, probably don't even need, really need to talk about what's the average speed that drivers go on I-35. Because we know what the speed limit is, but what is traffic actually going? Right? Everybody's impatient. Impatient. Life is so fast, so much. We want it now. We don't want to wait for it. And I told you what the gospel is. You didn't respond. Fine. I give up. I'm impatient. I want it now. I want you to be convinced. I want you to hear the truth. And I want you to change your mind right now. That's how we act because we're impatient. Paul, now Paul, he's keeping at it for two years. Change doesn't usually come overnight. This is true with individual people and it's true with groups and communities as well. Then some interesting things happen. Verse 11, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even his handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and evil spirits left them. And probably one of my favorite passages in the Bible, verse 13, there were some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits who tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. And they would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day, the evil spirit answered them and said, Jesus, I know, and I've heard about Paul, but who are you? And then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all, and he gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. And so on one hand, you have the power of God moving in Christ's name in such power that even Paul's handkerchief would heal people. And then you have frauds go out 
and get beat down by the powers of darkness. They saw the power of Christ through Paul and they saw others who were failing. And here's one thing we need to understand. What is going on in Ephesus and in the surrounding area? It's God's doing. God is the one doing it. They're not being changed lives and hearts just because Paul happens to be that great of a speaker. Because they're hearing the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is changing their lives from the inside out. Because God working in their midst is changing their hearts and their minds. Verse 17 says, When this became known to the Jews and the Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear. And the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. What's really interesting, our culture today does not see a connection there. So they were seized with fear, and so God was held in high honor. See, our society today says, no, no, that's messed up. You shouldn't fear. You shouldn't fear God. I mean, he loves you. He's so wonderful. He's so gracious and kind. And no, 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 no. Fearing God, he's not, he shouldn't be scary. Except for the fact that he's God. King of kings, Lord of lords, sovereign, all-powerful, righteous, holy, creator of the universe. And little, oh, sinful me. I, I should be afraid. It's interesting whenever people say, oh, God knows my heart. Yes, yes, he does. And that should not be a comforting fact. That should be a terrifying fact. Fact is, the Bible actually tells us in multiple places. Particularly, Proverbs 9.10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. See, there's something about fear that puts things into perspective. For us. Remember years ago, I was working, um, we were doing some decorations and stuff for the company I was working for, and I was up at the Waco Convention Center in a lift. Now, if you know anything, if you've ever been in that big hall at the Waco Convention Center, that is a 30 foot from the floor to the ceiling. And I was actually doing stuff in the ceiling recesses, which is like another six or eight feet. And so I'm 30 feet up in a lift. Do you think maybe fear was helping my perspective? That I actually had a deep respect for the reality of the situation and was careful in the way that I moved and what I did? Yeah, because that's what fear does. It gives you a, per, a perspective so that then you can bring your actions in line with the reality of the situation. We're in Texas, so how about a really good example? How about guns? Those are scary. For a lot of people, they're real scary. So scary, in fact, they want to, you know, take away your rights for them. But yes, you should be scared of guns. They kill people. They hurt people. The amount of accidental deaths is terrifying. And so, those of you who have guns, who've grown up around guns, you know this thing is dangerous. I need to respect it. I need to actually let this change my perception of how I handle it, the reality of the situation, and how I deal with it. Right? That's what fear does. Whenever you actually fear something that is rightfully terrifying, then yes, it can just put your perspective into, or you can put your view into right perspective so that you're handling reality for what it really is. The fact is they feared God it shows they recognized his power, his majesty, his glory. Verse 18 says, Many of those who believe now came openly, confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Let's do a little math. A drachma is roughly equivalent to, say, a day's wages. Whenever you turn that into uh, today's uh, money, uh, according to the statistics, I looked up the average hourly, the average wage income of a worker today is uh, $28 an hour. For easy math, because I was public schooled, let's round that down to 25. So you figure $25 a, an hour, eight hours of work, 25 times eight, $200 a day. Homeschool kids, check my math. 
Okay, one drachma is equal to $200, and this is 50,000 drachmas. You do that math, I came up with 10 million. So moved were they that they brought $10 million worth of merchandise and burned it. That's some dedication. That's some change of culture, amen? Whenever people are so gripped by the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, they take $10 million worth of um, sinful, wicked paraphernalia and items and just destroy them. I mean, I know there's been times whenever, you know, I've had something where it's like, oh, you know, I don't know why I have this book, you know, maybe I can go sell it at a used shop and get a few bucks for it. No! And pass that evil along to someone else, throw it out. Compost it, turn it into something good. How did this cultural change come about? How did it happen? Hearts were changed so that their sin became offensive to them. The reality of their sin was an offense to them because God had changed their heart. The gospel led to changed hearts, which led to a changed culture. Verse 21 and 22 just talks about Paul's uh, plans for his trip to Jerusalem. And there's some fun facts in there because it's really, it's the de- those kind of details that really point at the truth and, and reliability and historical nature of the Bible. Um, but for our purposes, we're going to skip those. There is a reaction to this advance in the culture war. What we see going on, Paul has proclaimed the gospel. Hearts have been changed. Culture is changing, right? The truth is advancing in a wicked culture. Enemy's not going to take it lying down. Verse 23. About that time, there arose a great disturbance about the way, about Christianity. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in a lot of business for the craftsmen there. Uh Uh-oh. The movement of God was so big, it's affecting the local economy. So much so that the people who make the idols are starting to feel the pinch. Imagine if businesses that made money off of sin started suffering economic loss because people were coming to Christ. That would be amazing. Put that one on your prayer list. We want to see a revival so mighty in our community that people who profit off of sin start going out of business. What if Planned Parenthood had to close its doors, not because some law was passed, but just because no one's interested in killing their babies? What if the uh, drag queen story hours, thankfully haven't, well, you know, I was going to say I haven't had any around here, but sadly we have. I believe there was something in Temple. What if the uh, drag queen story hours went away because no one wanted to have that filth in their communities? No, 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 not here. You can go somewhere else. What if the um, hateful divisiveness of critical race theory was not taught in schools because people were just unwilling to put up with that kind of nonsense and didn't want to teach other kids? However, the enemy is not going to take it lying down. Verse 25. Demetrius called them, that's the craftsmen, together along with the workers in related trades and said, you know, my friends, that we receive a good income from this business. And you see in here how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. And he says that gods made by human hands are no gods at all. Imagine that. Verse 27, there is danger not only to our trade that it will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the goddess Artemis will be discredited and the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia, will be robbed of her divine majesty. What's interesting is, just like in our day, they, they, they put forward what to their culture and their time sounds like, a, oh, yeah, we, oh, you know, Artemis. Oh, think of Artemis. I mean, we don't want her worship to go away. Yeah. But what's the real motive? Hey, guys, we're losing money. 
says he brought together all these people and said, hey, you know, we make a lot of good money on this, but this guy, he's making trouble. We're not making so much money. Oh, but plus, you know, Artemis. Oh, we got to look out for Artemis. Just like in our day, evil people come up with good sounding justifications for their sin. How many things do we have in our culture that the culture war tends to be fought over where what it is is some wicked practice that's being put a good face on. Oh, no, we're just, we, we just want this nice thing. Rather than acknowledging the fact that murdering babies in the womb is a multi-billion dollar a year industry, and that doesn't even count the selling of the body parts, which is gruesome enough, what is the messaging always about? Oh, it's about women's rights. Oh, those poor women. No, we got to love and care for the women. Oh, really? Not the billions and billions of dollars you're making. Let's lie and say it's about the women. People who teach things like the diversity, equity, inclusiveness training of the whole social justice, critical race theory movement and all of that make thousands of dollars, tens of thousands in some instances, to go teach a workshop or a seminar at a company or an organization. To just stand there and spend an afternoon spewing hateful garbage and you get to make thousands of dollars. But how do they sell it? Oh, it's about equity and fairness. Oh, we want fairness, right? I mean, you don't hate black people, do you? Oh, well, sure, absolutely. You gotta have one of these to make sure that your work environment is fair and equitable for everybody. But then what they do is they teach divisiveness and hate discrimination. The so-called gender affirming care, especially whenever it comes to children, is a very expensive and often requires a lifetime of medical care for people who go through that transition. Now, I don't tell you all that up front, but they're sure are willing to make all that money off of you. But what do they say? No, no, we're just helping them live their life for who they really are, to be comfortable in their identity, right? They give you those talking points, never mind that the doctors and the institutions, not to mention the pharmaceutical companies who make the hormones and the drugs, that's just one cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching over and over again. Every treatment, every surgery, and it brings about changes that will give them lifetime customers. Oh, no, 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 but it's, it's really about being affirming and caring for people. Yeah, it ain't about the money. It's what we have. In reality, it's about the money, about the selfishness, the gain, the power, the greed. That's what goes on in our culture today, and that's what was going on in Ephesus. The people who made the idols were losing money. Verse 28. And when they heard this, they were furious, and they began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! And soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius and Arist Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and all of them rushed into the theater together. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some were shouting another. Most of the people didn't even know why they were there. So many interesting things going on. One thing I'll note, some people that sent a message to Paul, Paul's like, I'm going to go in there and talk to him. Someone said, no, Paul, don't. Notice that some of the people who kind of discouraged Paul from going in there, it says they were officials in the province. So powerful had God moved and was the reputation of Paul and of Christianity. There were non-believing, eh, they may have been believers, but I'm thinking it identifies them as friends, not as believers or disciples. So non-believing officials held respect for Paul and for the gospel, even though they hadn't converted The unscrupulous men were motivated by greed and their sinful desire, and they make up a justification to stir up the mob and get people angry. Does that sound familiar? Mob stirred up by the uh, public relations campaign and talking points of the instigators. They do the bidding of these evil men. 
Satan's playbook hasn't changed very much, has it? Seems to be a lot of the same things going on. You know, you Christians, the only reason you're against abortion is because you want to control women's bodies. I didn't know that. Hadn't actually thought about controlling women's bodies, but apparently that's what it's all about, according to those who would oppose. The only reason we don't want critical race theory taught is not because we actually believe that we're all descended from Adam, all created by God in his image, all of equal value and worth before our creator, endowed with inalienable rights by our creator. No, 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 it's not that. It's we want to preserve our white privilege. Apparently, that's what they say. We're not against LGBT because we think that it is damaging to the very people who practice it and that it goes against the design of God's creation. According to them, the lies they spin, it's because we just hate gay people. That we're trying to deny rights to people. And on and on and on and on the lies go. And what happens is they say these and they preach these over and over again and they stir the crowd against Christianity. It says most of the people in the mob had no idea why they were even there. They just got riled up. Some were saying this, some were saying that. I know 2020 seems like it was a long time ago. But if you think back, what were those mobs doing? What were the people chanting? What were they saying? I don't know. Nobody really knows. Because some were saying this, some were saying that. A lot didn't even know why they were there. Stop and think about this. Last week we took a look at Pentecost. Some of the Jews who were there on the day of Pentecost, who gave their life to Christ, who gave their life to Christ at the preaching of the gospel by Peter, almost certainly some of those men were in the same crowd that was crying out for Jesus' crucifixion. What changed? Their hearts changed. See, because in the first instance, they're calling out for a crucifixion because the chief priests and the scribes have whipped them up into a frenzy. They didn't even know why they were there. They just got riled up. And now here they have a heart change and they see the truth for what it is. And the lies of the enemy can no longer manipulate them. And that is how you fight a culture war. The truth of the gospel shared boldly and persuasively, tenaciously, and patiently over time leads to changed hearts, and changed hearts lead to a changed culture. Yes, there is benefit to involvement in political and legal issues. That'll be next week. But the point today, what we see going on in this scripture this example given to us by God in his word where a culture got changed, we see what led to it. We see how it happened. We see that the truth of the gospel was preached and proclaimed. It changed hearts, and the changed hearts led to a changed culture. Politics are fine, but we're not called by God to make constitutional conservatives who follow traditional American values. Even if those traditional American values line up a lot of times with what is in God's scripture. That's not what we're called to. We are called to make disciples. Okay, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, great documents, they are not inspired by God. But George Washington cannot save you from your sins. We're called to make disciples of Jesus Christ, teaching them to obey all that he has commanded and baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The problem with our culture is not that it has messed up norms and traditions. The problem with our culture is that they need Jesus, that we are a fallen people who walk in sin, who have denied the truth of God's word and are following after our own lusts and our own desires. And instead, we need the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ to change our hearts. That little church on liberty Come praise the Lord, let your cup be filled. Raise your voices and we'll sing. Let God's freedom ring from that little church on Liberty Hill.